Hi everybody and welcome to City Beat. I'm your host Nancy Byrne and we are in the KCLV TV Channel 2 studios. Well, it took three years and a billion dollars, but the largest public works project in the history of Nevada is now complete right outside of City Hall around downtown. We affectionately refer to it as Project Neon. On August 8th, city, state, and federal dignitaries gathered to help celebrate the completion of the project. It was a big celebration for a big project. In all, it enhanced four miles of interstate between Sahara and the Spaghetti Bowl interchange in downtown Las Vegas. Currently, some 300,000 vehicles travel that stretch of highway every day, and traffic is expected to double in the next 20 years. You'll recall a few months ago here on City Beat, we featured our Walking the Beat segment out on a bridge that was about to open to traffic. We were joined by representatives from NDOT and Project Neon, as well as the City of Las Vegas Public Works Department Director, Mike Jansen, as the project achieved what is called the Substantial Completion Milestone, an achievement reached ahead of schedule and on budget. Now that included all of the new bridges and all of the new travel lanes being open to traffic. Now, with the final milestone completed, like finishing touches on landscaping and striping, the grand finale was celebrated August 8th. Since a traditional ribbon would certainly not do this ceremony justice, big screens were needed to celebrate the opening. So Project Neon started in April of 2016. They achieved substantial completion on May 15th of this year, which happens to be our city's birthday. And now August 8th will go down in the history books of the time we were able to close the books on Project Neon Detours. Congratulations to everyone involved in this tremendous project. We've started a new segment here on Channel 2 to kind of go along with our Open for Business and Discover the Fun segments. This one is based on a reality show we produced a little bit earlier this year called Inside Vegas. It shows city workers working tirelessly on the front lines and behind the scenes to keep our residents safe and happy. For this installment, we go out with Las Vegas Fire and Rescue and Metro Police as they try to answer the resounding call from many residents to stop the use of illegal fireworks. 5 Historically, 4th of July is one of the busiest nights for our fire crews. There's a lot of fires, a lot of injuries happen on that, and not to mention the issues with pets, the issues with veterans. Uh, it's just, it's just a you know, from what it was intended to be with the 4th of July celebrating the country, it's turned into a, a time for, for people to do silly things and start needless fires and injury, injury concerns. In 2018, the City of Las Vegas, local fire departments, and Las Vegas Metro Police set up a website, ispyfireworks.com, to kickstart a unified effort to fight the use of illegal fireworks. Residents were asked to report the use of these dangerous fireworks in their neighborhoods. It was geo-mapping to uh, locate hot spots for future enforcement, like this year. This year we will use last year's information to concentrate our enforcement. This year's I spy information will go towards next year's. Last year on this website, we had over 20,000 hits. Do the best you can to get as many people as you can, confiscate as many fireworks. They will take care of all the fireworks for you. Under no circumstances are you guys to leave them by themselves dealing with rowdy drunk guys with bombs. All right. It's, uh, it's doing what our constituents want us to do, what the people that pay us <coughs> want us to do. So thank you for coming out and be safe. I make a motion to approve this thank item. You. 
Thank you. There's a motion to approve agenda item 67. The ordinance that we're proposing converts, or at least allows us to convert the penalties that are involved in, in illegal fireworks use and handling and storage from a criminal misdemeanor to a civil penalty. It makes it easier for the courts. It doesn't tie up the court system, and it, it makes it easier for us during the enforcement nights to go ahead and issue the citation and then move on quickly. What we'll do is, is you guys will clear us. You'll give us a signal. We'll come in. We'll identify the stuff. The box truck will come in. We'll go to the next one. With Armed with citation books and the iSpy fireworks geomap from 2018, six teams headed out to the notoriously troubled areas. It's the psychology behind all of this stuff. You should notice they only have one in the street. We can't prove that they actually did it. It could have been them and ran in the house. Yeah. But as it gets darker, more houses, more people are going to come out. They're going to start shooting them off. It's a lot easier to target because it's a lot harder to hide the fireworks because at that time they start to bring them out because then they're going to start shooting them off in succession. So that's basically what we want to catch them doing. It makes it easier for us to bag and tag basically. Are you guys going to lead in? Yeah. So or should I follow us him? In the other car, we're both going to go over to the road ones first and see if we can find them. Okay, we're, we're right behind you, so yeah. right, we can go get these guys right here. We have wonders. By reading the label, you'll be able to tell it'll say shot okay. versus shower, okay. fountain, yeah. spark. Anything that says shoots or shots is illegal. Okay. We're shooting in the air. What are we looking at right there? Looks like mortar shells, reloaders. the stuff you buy here in Las Vegas, not in Pahrump, oh. not at the Indian Reservation. All right. If it goes up in the air and explodes, it's, it's illegal. It okay. If it explodes on the ground, it's illegal. That's it says he meets shower or sparks, so that's okay. safe. Be that's careful. okay. The city of Las Vegas wrote 40 tickets equaling about $10,000 in fines. Now that doesn't include what Metro wrote and other fire departments. We'd like to thank Las Vegas Fire and Rescue and Metro Police and photographer editor Eric Sorensen for heading out with them on the 4th of July. You can see this segment again right here on Channel 2 as well as our streaming networks Roku, Apple TV and Amazon Fire by downloading the app Go Vegas, one word. Well, let's stay on this fire theme a little bit longer. We often think of the summer months as wildfire season. Well, according to the Bureau of Land Management and the U.S. Forestry Service, there really is no specific season anymore. Here's more on why and what you can do to prevent forest fires. It's hard to believe the Carpenter One fire took place six years ago up on Mount Charleston. It spread more than 28,000 acres before being contained as it presented many challenges to firefighters with the summer heat and the steep terrain. Ray Johnson of the U.S. Forest Service remembers the fire and the eventual flooding created by the path the fire cleared. The plants, all the grass and bushes, hold the water back somewhat until it seeps into the, the soil. When we have larger fires like this, especially where there's a lot of incline, where it's steep in places, when it rains there's nothing to hold it back and then it flows downhill very quickly and it takes all the soil and sediment with it. That fire was started by lightning, but most wildfires are started by carelessness. Zachary Ellinger is with the Bureau of Land Management. 71% of all wildfires nationally are caused by people. So we have a huge uh, margin for improvement there and there are little simple things that people can do, being mindful when they're outdoors of how they could prevent a wildfire. Ellinger says many are started along roadsides by vehicles. Just doing some simple things like maintaining your vehicle, 
uh, your brakes and, and your exhaust system so that that doesn't accidentally spark a roadside fire is important. Many are started by ill-prepared campers or people building campfires out in the desert. We also have a lot of abandoned campfires and so someone will go out into the desert and want to have a fire and they won't bring anything with them to put that fire out so no water, no shovel. So we just tell people uh, if you're gonna have a fire do it in a responsible way, do it in an area that's free of vegetation and then clear that area around it of vegetation if there is any and then have a way to put the fire out. Drown stir feel with water. Fires are easy to start but once they begin to spread they are anything but easy to contain and extinguish. And according to these two experts, there is no longer anything such as a fire season. Fires are springing up in many areas of the country all year long. So in the typical sense of what we used to consider fire season, that's all gone out the window. And we are seeing fires get larger, grow faster, and consume more resources than they used to. Part of that is attributed to climate change, and part of it has to do with the fact that we've been suppressing wildfires for so long that a lot of that undergrowth that would have normally burned in a natural fire, fire cycle has accumulated. They credit public awareness with preventing even more fires from sparking, destroying important land and habitat for our wildlife. They also credit a campaign that started 75 years ago with this familiar guy, Smokey Bear. The Smokey Bear campaign has reached many millions of people over the years and we see this constantly whenever we go to an event people literally run up for photos or hugs so there's an instantaneous recognition and along with that recognition is that message of only you can prevent forest fires. It can take years for a forest to recover from a wildfire. Now, in the case of the Carpenter, one fire even longer because so much of the soil washed down that steep incline during monsoon season. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to tell you about a specialty court here in Las Vegas that is literally changing the lives of our youth. Congratulations to the City of Las Vegas Employee of the Month, Animal Control Officer Robert Aversa. Robert is known for his dedication to those in our community without voices, distressed animals, as well as their owners. He is committed to not only providing great customer service, but also to building a relationship with the community. Robert attends community events and spends time in our park so that he can get to know residents and neighbors. He seeks out ways to educate them on responsible pet ownership. He often works to help injured animals. For example, he's responded to many calls at Floyd Lamb Park where the geese have been hooked by fishing equipment. For his kindness, compassion, and dedication to the job, we tip our hat to Officer Robert Aversa, the City of Las Vegas Employee of the Month. A full life measured in seats starts with the right ones early on. Car crashes are a leading killer of children 1 to 13. Learn how to prevent deaths and injuries by using the right car seat for your child's age and size. I adopted Bento in 2010 from a shelter. As it turns out, we have very similar personalities. And this cat makes me make art because he's always motivating me to take pictures of him, to draw pictures of him. He just is motivating artistically. It's just that simple. Well, he's my best friend, but a lot of people know him as Keyboard Cat. Welcome back to City Beat from the KCLV TV studios. Here in the city of Las Vegas, we have six municipal court judges who, aside from their regular caseload, take time out of their schedule to run specialty courts. Now, these are courts designed to keep people out of jail. Sue Levitt takes a closer look at our youth offenders court. 
When youth ages 18 to 24 are arrested and land in our municipal court, a judge will offer them a deal rather than serving jail time. Not everybody accepts this deal, which is sticking to a strict two-year program. But those that do, it can be life-changing, as you'll see from our latest Youth Offender Court graduate. I have a great life. I have a great stepson and just a perfect family, cat, fish, things like that, you know, just what everything I've ever wanted. Today is an exciting day for Richard Motre. He's graduating from the Youth Offender or Yo Court program. It's been a long, hard road for Richard to reach this point in his life. About two years ago, Richard was an inmate in our city jail and brought here to the council chambers to watch others graduate from Yo Court. That's Richard you see walking in shackled and in custody, much different from what he looks like today. As he watched and listened to the graduates, he knew he wanted what they have. I'm totally a different person now, um, more calm. <laughs> Get a, little, a lot of jokes in now, you know. I have actually a sense of humor and things like that. I can share emotions. Richard describes the type of person he is today after completing Yo Court, but before the program, things were much different. Violent. Um, just disrespectful, didn't care about anyone, anything really, except myself. Richard's is a tough story. Um, as you know, Yo Court, uh, we require family participation, and when Richard came into the program, his father was in prison and his mother was in county. Life was far from easy for Richard. With no support from his parents, he began experimenting with drugs at a young age and eventually dropped out of high school in 11th grade. I started drinking and stuff by 13, 14, like 14 pills by 15, and then 16, and then by 17, 18, I was already on heroin and meth. I did the drugs to forget or just not feel the pain and not think about it. I was kind of one of those people that would steal something from you and help you look for it. And this became a way of life for Richard, on drugs, in and out of jail, until he reached Judge Cedric Kern's courtroom. I got charged for burglary, possession, burglary tools, possession, possession under the influence and running from the cops. What would you say was the most difficult part so far? Richard was facing two to five years in jail, or he could take Judge Kern's offer, keep his freedom, but get the help he needed by participating in Yo Court. I didn't want to be like my dad and go to prison. Badly wanting to change and not end up like his parents, Richard accepted Judge Kern's offer and entered Yo Court. It was crazy. They helped me with so much. I would never have thought that me accepting that deal two years ago would ever get me to, to the point I'm at now. He just got himself the, the most terrific fiance. I got to spend a little time with her, and he's got a stepson, and he's got a baby on the way. And this is a gentleman who has put his priorities in order, and we're really excited to see how this happens. It feels, uh, it feels unreal sometimes. You know, that I have a beautiful, you know, girl, I have a loving stepson, you know, and I have a baby on the way, you know. It's just everything's so real. I got a brand new car that I bought, you know, and it's just things that I never thought I would ever accomplish. And because of Richard's accomplishments, his entire family is doing better and following his example. When I was doing Yo Court, they got out of prison, my mom got out of prison, my dad got out of prison, and they started following in my footsteps. It takes so much time and we work so stinking hard, and then you get to be a graduation. I don't care what court you work for, what specialty court, because we all have one. We get to go home knowing that, dang it, one, it was worth it, and uh, two, we, we make a difference. And um, I don't know if many judges can do that when they go home, but. Luckily, here at Las Vegas Municipal Court, we all get to. Yeah, everything's going great. I mean, I'm just going to keep doing the stuff that I need to stay sober, keep the perfect life that I have today, and try to be the best father that I could be. And as Richard graduates today, here in the very council chambers, where he was first introduced to Yo Court as an inmate two years ago, he's thankful for his freedom 
the opportunity to change his life and remain sober, and grateful to Judge Kearns for making him sit through that Yocourt graduation two years ago. He's a savior. He's, you know, he changed my life. Everyone on that team did. They all changed my life for the better, and I couldn't have done it without them. For City Beat, I'm Sue Levitt. Thank you, Sue Levitt, for that story. Well, a little bit earlier in the show, we made reference to our Open for Business segments. These give us a chance to highlight new and unique businesses. Right now, we're going to take you to Ward 4 and Rooster Boy. This shortbread now, that's a recipe from my mother's friend. Welcome all the way from North Carolina. to eat here. Well, you better sit at the counter then. It's bright and early on a Thursday morning, and the team here in this cozy cafe is bustling. The kitchen and the crew of Rooster Boy Cafe may be small, but they are mighty, putting out fresh baked breads and pastries every single day to go along with unique breakfast offerings from egg dishes to homemade granola. We make everything from scratch. We, I mean, uh, people love our, our almond croissants and um, our pain au chocolat is great. The chocolate bread pudding we make with pain au chocolat and chocolate, I mean, that is heaven on a plate. Uh, we started making shortbread from um, my, mother, my friend's mom's recipe, Virginia. Uh, we, we make granola from scratch. Um, I mean, I just don't want to eat something that's prepackaged. And why would she use someone else's goods when she has the team and the talent to create her own delicious dishes? I'm a pastry chef and chef, and so I love to do both. But my beginning of my career, I always did pastries in restaurants and worked at very high-end restaurants. Born in Lebanon, Chef Sonia traveled quite a long road leading to the opening of this intimate restaurant, picking up culinary training and techniques every step of the way. And Las Vegas food lovers are the beneficiaries. I started my career in San Francisco, then I moved to New York, Paris, Belgium, Mexico City, Miami, not in that order. And then I continued, um, after I came back from Mexico City, I went to New York. Then I came to Vegas to visit some friends and I really loved the way they lived. I was like, wait, there's so much space, I love it. So then I moved here 10 years ago. This neighborhood cafe serving her favorite food was a dream that came true about a year ago. Well, I love breakfast food and so I've always wanted to do a restaurant that served breakfast all day. She says it took long hours, hard work, and the right people by her side. I have a great team. I mean, Don comes in at six and gets things organized. In the beginning, when I opened almost a year ago, I was coming in at 4.30, 5 o'clock. We were working like crazy hours, but now everything's in a system and we're ahead and we're never, you know, everything's organized. Aside from the amazing comfort food, she wanted the venue to be comfortable as well. Everybody that comes here says, oh, it's like cheers. People start talking to each other. Yesterday there was a debate whether a hot dog is a sandwich or not, and so everybody engaged and, you know, it's great. It's, it's really a neighborhood spot. So that begs the question, will this be the only neighborhood spot for Rooster Boy? I have a few other plans up my sleeve, but I just can't tell you yet. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. So stop on by, grab a chair at the counter or out on the patio, then grab a cup of coffee, a dessert or a full meal, and know that whatever you are served comes from the heart and the hands of a chef whose lifelong culinary achievements have led to every tasty bite. If you'd like to visit Rooster Boy Cafe, it's located at 2620 Regatta Drive, Suite 113. They're open for breakfast and lunch. How about something else new that's actually quite old? I'm talking about Hotel Apache, located in Binion's Gambling Hall. It's new and it's old. It's the Hotel Apache, now open in Binion's on Fremont Street. 81 rooms that harken back to 1932 when Binion's first opened as a mega resort. Mayor Carolyn Goodman and Councilman Cedric Creer were front and center to celebrate this new boutique hotel. 
it's such a wonderful time now because we are moving, we're getting back in business as never before. But to have the history and to have these 81 rooms that you renovated to put them back the way they looked originally. Councilman Creer says he's proud to represent this area of Las Vegas where, along with all of the new projects going up, our city's history is also embraced. You know, anytime we can bring something new and recreate what's old, I'm a big fan of it. I am a relic of Las Vegas and born and raised here, so I love to see the nostalgia that happens in our community. And I want to thank you for maintaining the nostalgia instead of always, you know, we have a tendency to tear things down and build new, which is great, but it's always great to all if we can maintain and, and refurbish what we have and make it new again. A proclamation was presented to the owner of the property. Thank you for returning this vintage piece of Las Vegas to downtown. Wonderful award five. With that proclamation came a hint of more projects to come to this historic site, including a 6,500 square foot bar called Whiskey Liquor Up at Binion's. I think most of you know we're doing a Whiskey Bar on the second floor. That should be hopefully in the next few weeks. And then you keep your eyes and ears open for more things to come, but I will um, not put a timeline to <laughs> So, with the cut of a ribbon. One, two, three. And the cutting of a cake, Hotel Apache was officially opened. Guests get to check in at the original front desk. And here's a look at one of the 81 rooms. When you step inside, you are taken back in time with the decor of the bedroom and the bathroom. And even some of the nostalgic accents, such as a rotary phone, you may have to explain that one to the kids, and a Victrola radio. But not to worry, you don't have to live as though it's 1932 on the nightstand right next to these pieces is the remote control for the television. It's not one of the mega resorts with thousands of rooms, but it does contain something a little hard to find in our Las Vegas hotels, our history. The Apache was the first air-conditioned hotel in Las Vegas. It also had the very first electric elevator. It's changed hands several times over the years, but in 2008 it was purchased by TLC, and that's the company moving forward with all of these new improvements. Well, that does it for another City Beat. As we go to close, we want to take you to an annual event held at Durfelt Senior Center, helping kids get ready for school with haircuts and a lot of other services. See you for the next City Beat.